recorded. Good evening. I'm Susan Moore, president of Friends of the Salmon River. Uh, first of all, the best of 2022 to all of you. If you're a woodlot owner, a farmer, a lover of forests, or you simply want to know more about tree planting, you have certainly come to the right place. Tonight's presentation, as you know, is the 50 million tree program. Make sure everybody can see your screen and hear you. I'm presuming that everyone can see my screen and hear me all right. Yes, yeah. Good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Screen. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Never hurts to check. Um, so this is our third event in the Winter Speaker Series of 2021 and 22. And as you know, we are partnered with our good friends, the Friends of the Napanee River. This presentation will be recorded. It is being recorded and then made into a YouTube video. We'll send you the link to this recording in a day or two. It will go to everyone who's registered and to our outreach email lists. It will also be posted on our Friends of Salmon River and Friends of Napanee River websites. So it will always be viewable. Just a quick mention of uh, membership. Anybody who is interested can um, take out a membership or donate to Friends of the Salmon River. Um, you can use our website with credit card or PayPal, or you can contact our treasurer and uh, mail a good old check as well. About the same with Friends of the Napanee River. You can go to their website and use the same methods, or you can also contact their treasurer. Um, obviously, you do not have to be a member of either group to listen and participate in our webinars, but if you wish to be, there's always the option. We have actually muted everyone at this point to avoid any background noise. However, right. if, if, if you are accessing us by phone, please be sure to mute yourself to prevent any phone, phone noise from disturbing the presentation. We thank you for that. Now I'm actually going to, uh, just before we get to the feature presentation, I'm actually gonna introduce uh, Lawrence O'Keefe from Friends of the Napanee River who has an announcement for us. Now, do we have to unmute Lawrence? Huh. Hang on Lawrence, we will unmute you if you can't unmute yourself. Yeah, or unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Uh, can you can you go back one slide by any chance? We can. Did yeah. you get the? That's it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Oh, oh wow. So, so I'm Lawrence O'Keefe with uh, Friends of the Napanee River, and this is just a a, a quick update on uh, something we had mentioned in our last session. It's not often that local residents are inspired to do some good in providing some of their property to enhance and provide stewardship to our environment. Larry Davey is one such resident of Napanee who was, ins was inspired to donate a small parcel of land to the town of Greater Napanee last summer for the sole purpose of having the property serve as a nature reserve. The property is located just off Palace Road and Clark and Kent Avenues near downtown Napanee. The property is just under a hectare and is a forested wetland and meadow area. As you can see from the illustration, it is also located directly across the river from King Street Park. The land will be named the Helen Hutchison Nature Reserve and will protect 275 meters of riverfront now on protecting both sides of the river. Under the leadership of Vicki Schmolka from Kingston, the transfer of Larry's property is nearing completion, and we're grateful to the group of volunteers from the Friends of the Napanee River and Friends of the Salmon River, who provided some tender loving care to remove a significant amount of garbage on the property this past summer. Vicki is in the process of finalizing all the paperwork and the transfer of the land to the town of Greater Napanee, and let me emphasize there's absolutely no obligation but making, but but we are asking for your financial support in making the final transfer of the land possible. With your support, we can remove wild parsnip and other unwelcome plants, replacing them with native plants. 
Your contribution will renew this forgotten gem. If you're able to help us out in making the Helen Hutchison Nature Reserve a reality, please go to the Small Change Fund website and search for Napanee. That's it for now for me. Thanks, and back over to you, Susan. Yeah. Great. Small Change Fund. Yeah. To the poster. Want to go out? Uh, Lois and Harley Smith, could you please mute yourself? Oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, if you, uh, if during the presentation you have any questions, please use the Zoom chat function to type in your questions or your comments. Direct your questions to everyone, and we'll ask your questions at the end of the presentation after both speakers have finished. Jim Hendry, if you want to begin sharing your screen, then I, have to unshare. I will go ahead and introduce you. <clears throat> Jim Hendry is a registered professional forester who has spent over 30 years helping manage our forests. He graduated originally from mm -hmm. the University of New Brunswick oh, Forest Management. Jim has worked for private industry, the Ontario government, conservation authorities, and not-for-profit agencies, where he's led a diverse range of forest management programs. For the past 10 years, he's operated a private forestry consulting business. Jim is currently the field advisor for Forests Ontario, working with the planting agents in Eastern Ontario, who deliver the 50 million tree program to landowners and community groups. I notice on the internet, Jim's name pops up a lot in, in different forest initiative, forestry initiatives. So he's obviously busy out there uh, on the ground. Um, okay, Jim, we are over to you. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, thanks Susan for that introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak to uh, the group tonight. It looks like you've got a, a really uh, large group uh, on, online, so that's great. Um, just so that I don't have any issues with bandwidth, I'm going to take my video off if I can do that. Um, and then I'll start the presentation. Mm. Well, I'm not able to do that, so hopefully uh, it'll be okay. Okay, so um, as the introduction, Susan's introduction said, uh, I'm the field advisor for Force Ontario and uh, for the 50 million tree program. And there are a number of uh, field advisors for Force Ontario for the 50 million tree program, um, but I cover in the I cover the east, so uh, approximately about from uh, the Lower Trent Conservation Area watershed all the way over to the Quebec border, and uh, that's my area of responsibility. Uh, now I'll give you a, a little bit of an overview on relative to Force Ontario, and but most of the, most of the presentation will be talking about their tree planting initiative. Uh, the mission statement for Forest Ontario is to increase Ontario's forest and landscape. And there are three pillars uh, that they use to accomplish that mission. Uh, one is tree planting that we'll talk about uh, momentarily. Uh, the other is forest education. And the third pillar is community engagement. So a bit about forest education uh, initiative under Forest Ontario. Uh, they have a number of initiatives relating to forest education, whether it be Envirothon, working with uh, high school students to talk about aquatics, forestry, uh, soils, and the like. And uh, I guess basically um, uh, teaching our young folks to become future stewards of the land. We also have forestry in, in the classroom where, where they match up a professional with a classroom that wants to learn more about forestry. There's also the program called Tree B, which is a tree identification program uh, and focus on forest. And focus on forest is the lending of resources, teaching materials to, to the classroom, to the, to the students and the teachers for both indoor and outdoor education. Uh, the community engagement 
Um, there are uh, a number of initiatives under that particular pillar, and it's all about raising awareness of the value of uh, a healthy ecosystem or a natural ecosystem, which includes obviously, obviously forests. And uh, initiatives under that particular pillar are the uh, Christmas market in, in Toronto, where we donate the very large tree. Uh, reconciliation community tree planting is another initiative under that. Some of you who've traveled through Northern Ontario or Northeastern Ontario would see these large, large signs called the Takes a Forest. That's also led by Forest Ontario. We also have a photo, photo contest. And then finally, a, a heritage tree where landowners uh, put forward a tree that is very special, in most cases, very large, very old, and it uh, goes through a review process and becomes known as, as a heritage tree. Uh, if in fact, it meets the criteria. So those are the two uh, pillars. Um, the third one, which occupies, I would say, most of our time and resources is tree planting. And on an annual basis, we plant between 2.5 to 3 million trees each year. And there's two programs within the planting program. One is the 50 million tree program. This is a provincially based program, uh, one that you would, have, you would have heard about. Uh, and then the one that's national is the Forest Recovery, Forest Recovery Canada. That's much smaller in number, uh, but we do get involved in plantings right across uh, Canada. So more on the 50 million tree program, uh, Forest Ontario is the lead delivery agent for this particular program. Um, but it is done in working with, in partnership with our uh, many partners. And I'll talk a little bit more on that. So it's, it's definitely a collaborative effort uh, to get trees in the ground in, in, on, in Ontario and specifically in Southern Ontario. The funding for this particular program at this point in time is Natural Resources Canada. On average, uh, you're looking at uh, about 70% comes from Natural Resources Canada, and the rest comes from private and, and corporate uh, donations. There also is the other part that private landowners contribute to, and I'll, I'll let Steve talk on that uh, later. Um, over the last, uh, well, in, in, since 2008, we've dealt with over 4,000 landowners uh, to plant trees on, on their land. So it, it's, uh, it started out small, um, but the program has really, really grown. And, and now we're, uh, in terms of this year, we're almost at 3 million trees for planting for 2022. So, with regards to the 50 million tree, or the 50 million tree program, um, Forest Ontario is not just involved in the, the planting. Um, and the planting would not take place unless we work in the entire cycle. We call that seed, seed to forest. So I'll just go through it very briefly uh, and talk a little about Forest Ontario's involvement and also the partners as well. And let's start right at the top at seed and cone forecasting and collection. So as we all know, if we didn't have uh, seeds, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have trees. Um, we work very closely in the, the seed forecasting uh, and the seed allocating to different uh, nurseries and, and working with the nurseries and also in the collection. Not that we collect them, but we work with private collectors and the nurseries to ensure that the seed that is collected in a certain zone is planted in that zone. And if there is some moving of seed from from one zone to another that this is known and recorded by the nursery. The growing of trees is uh, specifically done by, by the nurseries. Um, and in that we help there in uh, working with them relative to allocations, working with them in providing them with uh, upfront some funds for partial, partial growing of some of the trees. And of course, in quality control as well, uh, looking over that. The, uh, the third, uh, box that you see on, on our right, which is Landowner Connections. This is where the planting delivery agents, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly in the next slide, is where, the, you, know, where you see the engaged <laughs> private landowner. And this is the agency that is the boots on the ground and we work with them as well. Then there's the tree planting. Uh, the tree planting is either coordinated by the planting delivery agent or undertaken directly by the planting delivery, delivery agent. Um, and there's also monitoring involved. 
And then the, the final box on the, on the left-hand side um, is managing your, your new force. Um, we provide advice to private landowners in, in uh, conjunction with the planting delivery agents as well. Um, and also Forest Ontario is uh, works um, at leading the uh, tree marking, tree certification marking course across the province. So that's another uh, one of the uh, programs that we're involved. In. I mentioned the planting delivery agents a couple of times already. Uh, they're a key partner in the 50 million tree program. Uh, they are, as I said earlier, the boots on the ground. They do. They they take care of the land or contacts, the planning or the planning of the planting plan, sometimes known as a site plan, the planting or coordinating the planting, and also the monitoring. Now, right across the province, we have 55 planting delivery agents, um, and I thought I'd bring it closer to home relative to eastern Ontario, the the areas or the the area that I'm that I take care of, uh, and that you'd be most interested in, and that's in eastern Ontario. So in that area, we have two, four, six, eight, uh, nine planting delivery agents. And you can see the bottom three um, in green text. Uh, those are most relative to um, the watershed of, of the Salmon River and, and that area around on Belleville, and that being Bancroft Area Forest Industry Association. They operate out of more of the northern part, uh, North Hastings, North Frontenac, uh, sustainable resources. Um, they operate mainly in the north, but they do a lot of contract planting in the south. And our second speaker for, to, for tonight, uh, Steve Pitt, is more in the southern part of, of your area. So a bit about uh, eligibility criteria for landowners to enter into uh, to, or to become eligible within the 50 million tree program. <laughs> Uh, first, you must have at least um, the area that you wish to plant must be able to hold at least 500 trees or uh, one hectare, depending on the local PDA. And I say that because some planting delivery agents are not able to deliver a planting program that small because of economy of, economy of scale. And so therefore, they may have a, they may have a, a lower limit of one hectare, which is more in the order of 2,000 trees. Uh, and depending on the planting delivery agent. The second thing, the, the land must be suitable for trees. Um, it seems like a no brainer, um, but obviously we, we want the trees to grow successfully. The landowner wants them to grow su successfully. So we have to be uh, careful in making sure that the site will actually support trees to maturity. The land must be open land. Um, and what I mean by that is few or no trees. Uh, some of the areas we, we get involved in are, are overgrown with, with brush, uh, heavy, heavy weed competition, and that is considered open land. It just doesn't have trees. Um, in addition to open land, sites that are directly impacted by climate change, and I use the example of ice storms, so ice storm damage forests could also be um, eligible even though they're, they're not open. And then finally, more concern, this the planting delivery agent takes care of this, but the stock that's used, the, the seedlings that are used on site must meet minimum standards. So types of projects uh, that uh, are eligible and that landowners are interested in. Uh, first, it is an afforestation program. And what we mean by that is planting trees on open land. Uh, so uh, typically these areas are large block areas, but they could also be windbreaks uh, to slow the wind down, to conserve the soil, protect, protect against uh, the blowing, blowing snow. So there's a lot of windbreaks that are used. Riparian areas are also eligible, areas adjacent to streams and wet areas. And then finally, climate change. And as I said earlier, areas that may be affected by climate change, such as ice storm. And we refer to that as forest restoration. Um, the program is eligible to private landowners, um, absentee or, or living on site, um, the farmers, uh, municipalities, uh, and, and businesses. So private land in, in, the, in the broader scope. So um, 
this uh, map shows a lot of uh, a lot of dots, a lot of brown areas, um, and most of it's concentrated south of Algonquin Park. And what that represents are all the different planting sites since 2000, 2008 for the 50 million tree program. You can look a little bit above that, uh, that Southern Ontario, above Algonquin Park, and you'll see scattered areas um, near Dryden, Rainy River, Thunder Bay, Hearst, and that's all private land in, in the Northern Ontario. So the program is pro provincially based or provincial, provincially wide, uh, but most of the private land, as we know, is in, in Southern Ontario. So going over the numbers, uh, since 2000, it says 2007, it should actually say 2008. Since 2008, it's 34 million trees in the ground, uh, over 17,000 hectares uh, planted and representing 6,000 projects. So 6,000 projects is more than 4,000 landowners that I mentioned earlier, but in some cases, landowners will have a project one year and follow up several years later with another project. So um, definitely approaching the 50 million uh, namesake of the, of the program. Um, bringing it a little closer to home, um, here are some of the numbers uh, to areas that uh, I think most of the, uh, the audience will, will, are from. So in Hastings, uh, since 2008, we have just a little over 900,000 trees. Nice. Yes. Is the volume okay? Susan? Yeah. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I just got a little bit of feedback there. Yeah. Um, Lennox and Addington is uh, 683,000 uh, since the program started. Uh, Frontenac uh, leads, the, leads the race there for, for your area at uh, 1.2 million since the program, and Prince Edward County is uh, over a half a million. So, um, by any measure, um, you know, quite impressive. Um, I will say that I've been in the program working with it now for three years and definitely this past year has seen a considerable uptick in, in, in interest. So uh, if you're interested, um, if the public is interested, they can do one of three things. If they know who the field advisor is, um, they can contact that person and me for Eastern Ontario. Uh, if they know who the planting delivery agent is, they can contact that individual. But most, uh, probably 90% of all our planting referrals come from the Forest Ontario website. And on that site, uh, landowners go in uh, and they fill out a fairly uh, straightforward application. Um, where do you live? Where's your property? How many trees would you like to plant, and uh, and the reasons for, for planting them? Um, once that is application is is filled out, uh, then uh, I receive all the applications east of uh, Lower Trent Conservation Area, um, and I review the applications for any any information that may be missing. Um, uh, or uh, errors in, in, in address and so on. Um, and if I feel that based on the application that they meet the app, they meet the requirements, then I refer them to the, the appropriate planting delivery agent. So if we receive something sort of in the Cornwall area, uh, I'll be referring that to the Raisin Region Conservation Authority, where if I receive something in, uh, you know, South Hastings, then uh, Steve will re receive that referral. The next step um, is the site visit. This is, this is the responsibility of the planting delivery agent after contacting the landowner and they're looking at a number of things and I won't steal Steve's thunder. Uh, he'll get into that. Uh, he'll also, or they will also prepare a planting plan if um, the field of visit confirms that the, plant, the, the site meets the guidelines. A landowner agreement is signed, a 15 year agreement. Uh, and then from there, on the ground happens, the, whether it's site preparation, planting and tending. Uh, in some cases, cases it's just planting and tending. Um, and then monitoring um, for a number of years, five years uh, after, after planting. So that's a, uh, a general overview of Force Ontario. I understand that, that uh, Susan is going to moderate questions later, and I'd be happy to, 
to answer any, any questions, whether it's related specifically to your area or right across the province or uh, the 50 million tree program. That's great. Thanks very much for all of that, Jim. And yes, as you just mentioned, we are going to save all the, um, the whole question period until after uh, Steve Pitt is actually done. Um, and all the proper thanking will be done then, then as well. So um, Steve Pitt, if you want to just start sharing your slides, I'll go ahead and introduce you. And I think you'll be able to unmute yourself, Steve. I think I am. There you are. <laughs> hey, and many of you know our next speaker. Steve Pitt is a local forestry consultant. He's worked with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for over 40 years. He's helped Forest Ontario deliver the plantings of the 50 million tree program in Lennox and Addington and Prince Edward counties, as well as the Quinty area How do I advance it there? for over 10 years. Steve was the past coordinator of the Lennox and Addington Stewardship Council, which is how I know him. And he's also worked with many community groups, including the Ontario Woodlot Association. So Steve, it's over to you. Slides look fine. Good, so far so good. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for having me here tonight. Um, yeah, I uh, spent a lot of time with the Ministry of Natural Resources over the years involved in tree planting. And um, when I retired, um, it kind of uh, gets in your blood and you can't let a spring go by without planting a tree. So I was approached by Forest Ontario and they asked me if I'd like to be a delivery agent uh, for the uh, area of uh, Lennox and Addington, Prince Edward County. And just recently I picked up some work in the uh, Southern Hastings County, Belleville, Corbyville, um, up towards Frankfurt and Sterling. So that's kind of new. Um, I run a small business with my partner and my wife. We do 50 million tree planting program. We also do the managed forest tax incentive program. And we do woodlot evaluations, a uh, little bit of butternut work. Uh, and also I've been getting into some work uh, with woodlot owners that uh, just don't know what tree to cut. So I've been giving them advice and offering some marking for um, identifying trees for removal to meet their particular objectives. So I'm going to go through uh, tonight what uh, uh, I do. And just before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the history of tree planting in, in Southern Ontario. It's been around for almost 140 years. Um, it started back in uh, 1883 with the Ontario Tree Planting Act. And what happened there was there was a lot of land clearing going on at the time because, because people were opening up the land for farming. Uh, woodlots were being harvested for firewood and for uh, timber to build buildings, wooden buildings. And uh, because of all that clearing, there was widespread erosion. So the government at the time decided that they would pay woodlot owners 25 cents a tree to uh, dig saplings out of their woodlots and plant them along the roadsides. And uh, uh, that, that lasted for a while. And uh, actually, uh, there's a program out there right now. You can check it out after this. Uh, called Maple Leaves Forever. It's, a, it's a, a program where you can get funding to do roadside planning, focusing you know, mainly on maple. Um, after that, in 1905, um, the first provincial tree nursery was started south of Stratford. Uh, again, uh, uh, the chief forester at the time uh, saw the, um, the effects of widespread erosion and, and convinced the government at the time to establish a tree nursery, and that was the first one in Ontario. And at that time, those seedlings were given free to farmers to plant on their land. Uh, after that nursery, a few years later, there were four major nurseries established in Ontario, one at St. Williams, uh, one at Kempville, south of Ottawa, Orono Nursery, which is north of Bowmanville, and uh, Midhurst uh, Nursery, which would be west of Barrie up in that country. Uh, now another uh, program that came along that did a lot of tree planting and did a lot of good across the province was the agreement, uh, uh, agreement forestry program. And that uh, was a, a government program that allowed municipalities to uh, enter into agreements with the government to plant uh, uh, idle lands that were badly eroded. A lot of these lands came back to the county from tax arrears 
and sat there um, uh, uh, in a bad state. So the Agreement Forest Program came along and they planted vast areas and locally uh, the Ganaraska Forest, uh, Port Hope area, North Port Hope, uh, the Northumberland County Forest, um, uh, closer to home would be the Lennox and Addington County Forest up at Flinton. There was about 1100 acres up there that was planted uh, once upon a time or years ago and is now yielding and has been yielding uh, a, a, a decent amount of timber uh, from those plantations. And uh, actually over that term of the Agreement Forestry Program, over 360 million trees were planted across Ontario. These are large forest holdings. Um, another program that came along that I worked with for a long time was the Woodland uh, Improvement Act program. It started in 1966. And again, it was a government funded program that wanted to get trees on idle forest land. And it also provided um, incentives for people to do, uh, manage their woodlots property. Uh, it, it, it required a 15 year agreement, similar to what the 50 million program is. And there were 13,000 agreements, um, uh, landowners went in, into agreements through that program. Um, I can remember when I was working with the program in the early 80s, uh, the landowners had to pay a penny a tree to get uh, their trees planted on the property. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, then it jumped to five cents. And by the end of the program, the WIA program, it, it was about 10 cents per tree for the landowner cost. And uh, the government funded everything else. Uh, so you can see there were a lot of similarities uh, between the WA and the 50 million program. Now, many of these plantations that were planted through the WA program are now being thinned. I know of a couple that are on their second thinnings. I know Jim's been working on some plantations as well that are, are requiring thinning. So they're at the stage now where they're starting to yield timber. Um, now, a lot of that uh, came came down in, in flames uh, during the, uh, about 1995. Uh, the Common Sense Revolution came along and uh, the WIA program was canceled. The Agreement Forest Program was canceled. Sometime later, the tree seed plant in Angus was shuttered. So a lot of the infrastructure that we had in place uh, for many, many years was, was uh, cast aside. And uh, we had to rebuild that through the 50 million program. It was a long, you know, it was a lot of work to, to get things up and running again. So how it works, um, Jim kind of touched on it. Uh, basically landowners sign on to the Forest Ontario site and then those referrals are sent on to Jim. Jim screens them, he sends them on to me. I screen them again. Um, and then site visits are organized. And what I'm screening for is sometimes sites will come to me and I can use aerial photography and soil maps to determine if it's a potential property. Um, there's a lot of land that's quite shallow. Uh, I'll show you a map uh, showing the areas around where we live that are, is difficult to support trees, especially with the way the climate is going now. Um, there, it used to be things would uh it would it would rain when we expected rain april showers bring may flowers type thing and now the weather patterns have changed so much that we 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 might be able to we we once upon a time we could get away with some of the shallower sites or uh but now we can't and there's a lot of a lot of shallow land in prince Edward county lna county not so much in hastings um so uh I do screen a lot and make sure they're not treated. And uh, if it looks like a good fit, um, I visit the landowner. Uh, we, we get on the land. I check the soil to see what, what type of soil we're working with, the uh, moisture, uh, if it's poorly drained uh, or excessively drained. And then uh, we decide uh, with the landowner's objectives in mind, uh, what native species are, are best suited for that particular site. Often there's a, 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 you know, a several species that'll work on, on certain ground. Um, and the, the ones we're primarily using in this program are white pine. Uh, I do a lot, of, uh, a lot of white pine. We do a bit of white spruce, some cedar, uh, red pine, Norway spruce, a uh, bit of tamarack, and we're also doing a little bit of hardwood, but not a lot. Um, hardwood is, uh, uh, um, is, is hard to grow 
uh, it's more expensive uh, and um, it requires a lot more time and energy to get a successful uh, hardwood plantation. If the landowner is willing to do it, uh, we, we have made arrangements to, to look after that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention that I've been planting for a, lo a long time and in the last 10 or 12 years, um, I've seen uh, uh, droughts. Uh, we've had awful drought in 05. We had a bad one in 2012. In 2016, we had a drought. Uh, we lost 40,000 trees in that drought. Um, and th that was the type of drought where, where, where wells had been around for 60 years, 70 years that went dry. It was a very severe drought. So those types of things are, are impacting our planning. So we're trying to pick the sites that uh, 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 aren't so um, um, susceptible to those droughts. And staying off some of the shallow ground is one, one route to take. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, typically we would start tree planting around April 23rd, April 16th, you know, in that, in that ballpark. And, and we're always finished by the long weekend in May. That's sort of the window that we plant in. Uh, but uh, in the last 10 years, I've had the earliest start ever in my career. We started March 27th. That was the year that the 25 degree heat came on the last, uh, uh, last bit of March. And of course, once the heat hits the trees at the nurseries, they have to be lifted out of the ground and moved and, and, and put into cold storage. So you have, to, you have to go, you can't delay. So I've had the earliest start in my career and I've also had the latest start in my career. Uh, so the weather's all over the place these days. You just can't, you just can't count on anything. There's a soil map of uh, southern Ontario, uh, southern Lennox and Attigan County, and, and you can see uh, Amherst Island down the lower right. It's mostly gray. That's a lot of clay. You can see that orangey color on the west side of it. That's all Farmington loam. And if you move a little bit north on that map, you'll see that the central portion there is, is pretty much all orange. Uh, that's, that's a, a land uh, classific or soil classification called Farmington loam. So I use these maps a lot. Once I find out where you live, I'll go to my soil maps and just see what we're dealing with. And through experience, I know Farmington loam's risky. Uh, I know what to expect on an Amelia's, uh, Amelia's bird clay loam. I know what to expect on a Hillier clay. Uh, a lot of the vineyards down in Prince Edward County are planted on Hillier clay. And uh, it, it, it's good for grapes. But it's a, it's a fragmented rock that's scattered through the upper layers of the soil. And, and when you get hot, dry weather, those rocks heat up. They'll draw moisture out of the ground. And it's just not a, a great spot to be trying to work in. So just through experience, I know which soil types uh, are work well and which ones not so well. This is a planting site on the Wilton Creek watershed south of Morven. Um, this is a, about a 90 acre uh, farm. You can see the red line depicts the boundary of the farm. And you can see Wilton Creek coming in from the east side and kind of snaking its way over to the property there. You can see the dark area around the property, that's all forested. And uh, what I wanted to point out on here, the yellow areas that I've kind of used hash marks on, that's all been planted. There was about 30,000 um, uh, trees planted on this property. 60% uh, of it was Norway spruce. This site's a little on the shallow side and the decision was made to go with Norway spruce because it tends to be a little bit drought hardy. So if you do, you have a better chance on a risky year by, by working with something that can deal with uh, the drought. Uh, so it was about 60% Norway, 15% white pine, 15% white spruce and 10% white cedar was planted. Uh, so we had 30 acres of exist existing woodland, and then we had another 30 acres planted. And then there's some uh, scattered meadows and wetlands in there as well. Uh, the guy that owned, the, the couple that own this, they're in their 90s. And um, their, uh, their idea is to uh, plant it back. They're, 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 they're going to turn it back into trees. That's what they want to do. So uh, I've been working with them and Rick Nafton, who's the delivery agent for the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority has been working with them as well. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good project. We're happy with it. Some of the trees did die during 2016 and we did refill that. 
there is a refill mechanism through this program. So if you were to plant a property and you get one of these awful droughts and you lose them, there is a way to do a replant. Um, the other thing about this program, this landowner is in the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, just uh, check it out online. It's a good program to le learn more about your property and to save some money on your taxes. But any of the trees that are planted on your property are eligible to be put into the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program. So this particular fellow, I wrote the plan for this, pro uh, the management plan for this one. And I think we got 30 acres of woodland, 30 acres of plantation, and I think we got another 10 acres so, uh, of wetland and meadows. So we've got about 70 acres that qualified for the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program. The other thing I like about this project was you can see the forested area there. So we just expanded and made that forest patch bigger by adding those conifers. And we gave a little bit of riparian protection where the trees were getting close to uh, Wilton Creek. So this is how we do it. The little tractor on the lower picture there, that's what we use uh, to do our band spraying. Uh, Jim mentioned uh, earlier how we do uh, site preparation. Most of the times uh, I ask the landowners to bush hog the site prior to planting. So say it was an old hay field or just weeds and grasses, you get a much better planting job if you knock those down prior to planting. If you're not opposed to herbicide on your property, we use a Roundup-based product, a glyphosate product. And what we do is we spray a strip about 14 to 16 inches wide and kill all the grass and weeds in there. And then we plant the tree down the middle of the, uh, of the band. Uh, the little tooth that's on the front of that tractor, that's a scriber. So what we do is uh, we'll run the tractor across the fields on eight foot centers. And then that scribes a mark. And then before, if the, it takes about seven days for the herbicide to show up. So if we're planting and spraying in the same week, we can scribe land and the planters will come in and, and follow that scribe and, and put the trees in before the herbicide gets time to work, if you, if you, know, if you can follow that. Uh, this is the, the top picture, the uh, actual machine in, in progress there. We run two tractors, uh, six person crew. And um, I contract out all my tree uh, planting to uh, 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 a family run um, tree planting business. Uh, and they've been doing it for me. I, I, told, I told her when she quits, I quit uh, because she does such a good job and it makes my, my job, uh, my life so much easier. It's really nice planting. Um, let's see, what else can I say about that? Uh, some people are shying away from uh, herbicide, and that's fine. Uh, we, I, I have done some plantings where we don't use herbicide, and uh, I've been doing um, some survival assessments on those properties, and, and I'm, I'm actually surprised myself that uh, we're getting as good a survival rate as we, we are without using herbicides. Usually trees for their first two years, that's the critical time when you put new seedlings in the ground, First year for sure, second year a little bit less. But if we hold back the grass and weeds for two years, the success rate's really good. Um, if you don't use herbicide, if it's on a real productive site, the, the grass and weeds might get over them uh, and, and you, may have, you may not have as good a survival rate as, as you wanted. So, but again, it's up to you. You can do brush, uh, you can do bush hog between the rows and that'll help a little bit. This is a planting we did um, last year. No, two years ago, 2020. Uh, this is a site near the Moscow uh, dump. We put 10,000 trees in there. It's owned by the municipality of Stone Mills. And that was strip sprayed with uh, Roundup and then planted with three-year-old white pines. And uh, you can see the picture on the, um, on the left there. Uh, a white pine emerging through the grass and weeds. And then the picture to the lower left, you can see they're quite prominent. Uh, they're coming up through the grass and weeds. And once they get above the grass and weeds, they're pretty well off. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of trouble with uh, competing. Um, so the first, like I say, the first couple of years are, are really, really critical. This is a planting about 12 years 12 years, maybe 13 years. Uh, it's white pine. It's reaching, I don't know, maybe 12, 16 feet in places. Uh, really good survival rate. This is on a dare road, just um, 
west of the Salmon River. Um, and you'd notice those hardwoods in the background, looks like some ash and maple. And typically what happens on these plantations, uh, you will get natural seeding coming in from uh, whatever seed source you have nearby. Ash and maple are, are quite good at it. And bitternut hickory, I see a lot of that coming in, mixed in on some of our plantations. So um, you will get some variety uh, and diversity in your plantation um, just through hardwoods that are going to seed in. And if you get up around areas like around Tamworth and Camden East, there's, there's a lot of small fields up in that area that are ringed with hardwood trees. And uh, if you get the west winds blowing and you've got a seed source, it'll blow those wing seeds quite away. And uh, they, have, they do uh, pretty good at establishing themselves in small openings in the conifer plantations. This is a, a spruce plantation about the same age. Uh, and this is over on uh, Wilton Creek, uh, just west of uh, Wilton. It's a spruce plantation. This was planted about the same time as the fine plantation. Uh, spruce is a little slower off the mark than uh, white pine. I like planting white pine because it, it grows fast and uh, it's easy to grow. And you can notice this one here, the landowner's been uh, mowing in between. So again, uh, I'm pretty sure this one's been, uh, this particular landowner has been mowing since the trees went in the ground. And uh, so it, it, it is helping. I also wanted to point out, as you can see on the, um, on the uh, right hand side of that plantation, how small the trees are adjacent to the hardwood tree line there. And uh, that's uh, kind of indicative. They're competing with the hardwoods that are along that edge. Uh, but that's a nice plantation and it is, it goes right down to the actual Wilton Creek, a very successful plantation there. Uh, this one is uh, north of Colebrook and you can see the taller trees there. Those are a juniper or red cedar. Um, Jim mentioned earlier that we only plant open land. This particular property had scattered uh, juniper on it. And I, uh, if, if, if a farmer was to walk away from a farm field in most of the area that I work, it wouldn't take too many more years after they leave the field before the juniper comes back. It's, it's everywhere. Prince Edward County is, is loaded with, with thousands and thousands of acres because a lot of land down there was cleared and it, it shouldn't have been in the first place. It's poor farmland, so it was abandoned and then the juniper comes back in. In this case, it wasn't too thick. Uh, so what we did on this particular property, uh, we hand planted, this was a few years ago, we hand planted it with white and red pine. And what'll happen here is the red and white pine will eventually catch up to the juniper and juniper only thrives in sunlight. So what will happen is the pine will overtake it and shade it out. And then uh, we've actually used the juniper as a bit of a nurse crop. When you plant around juniper like that, or it, it provides a little bit of wind protection and shade, uh, shade so it helps uh, nurse the, uh, the, the smaller crop along. And I have done, if you do have juniper on your fields uh, that scattered, uh, not too thick, if we can drive a tractor in and around it, leave it standing, as opposed to cutting it down. It's easier for us to maneuver around something we can see instead of bumping into old stumps and roots. So we've done that quite a bit, just kind of snaked around the field and got the trees in. Uh, this is a planting over near Caring Place. It was 16,000 uh, trees. We did that this year. Uh, yeah, last year, we did that last year. Actually, Jim was out to this site. So it was uh, white pine, white cedar, red pine, and then hardwoods. We put in some oak, uh, red oak and bur oak. So this was strip sprayed. You can see the, the herbicide in action there. And then uh, we just uh, randomly planted um, the um, oak hardwoods amongst the white pine. And uh, of course, when you do hardwoods, uh, grass control is very important. They're more sensitive to weed competition but also they're very sensitive to uh, rodents and rodents will track them down and girdle them through the bark. And uh, so this landowner, uh, I, I told her, you can't do it without putting tree guards on, you're just wasting your time and money. Uh, so she put, uh, she put all the tree guards on and uh, things are really doing well on that property. It's really good ground. And uh, you can see the surrounding uh, trees in the area. You can see some white pine off in the distance. It looks like a spruce over on, on the right-hand side there. 
and uh, it's coming along quite nicely. Jim mentioned earlier about uh, seed zones. Uh, in Ontario, um, there's 38 seed zones. Uh, down around uh, Windsor is seed zone 38. Uh, the GTA up around Lake Simcoe and sort of uh, the middle of uh, the central part of Southern Ontario is seed zone 34. In Napanee, uh, where I am, it's 36. Prince Edward County is 36. And in Tamworth, 35. So this white pine that we got from Somerville Seedlings was uh, seed zone 36. So if, if, I'm planting in, if I'm planting trees in 30, seed zone 36, I'll, I'll order trees from seed zone 36. You can do a little bit of movement. I am planting some zone 34 material uh, this coming spring um, and it should be okay. So if all, this, all, the, all the stuff that we plant on your property, it's all tracked so we can uh, gauge how well it's done. So this is one of the bigger projects we did. This is down at Sandbanks Provincial Park. We planted um, 90,000 trees over three years. They had a piece of land that they bought from a local farmer many, many years ago and leased it out to the farmer until he was done with it. Um, he was 90 when he uh, gave up the land. Um, so we planted a lot of white pine in here, white spruce and some uh, white cedar. And then there's a group uh, at Sandbanks Park called the Friends of uh, Sandbanks Park. And what they do is where we've had some mortality, they'll go in and spot plant hardwoods. Uh, they order up some hardwoods every year and, and go in and fill in the gaps. Uh, uh, if you ever get a chance uh, to drive down there, these trees, um, they're probably 90%, 95% survival. It's done really well. And it, it's starting to come up through the grass and weeds now. It's quite, uh, quite a sight. So there's about, uh, yeah, 90,000 trees down there. So um, every year I take, uh, I take my granddaughter back there. She's two there and the trees are three years old. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a nice connection. She just lives around the corner in Wellington. So we go back there and check them out. Uh, the other thing that we do uh, with these uh, plantings is um, after they're planted, that's not the end of it. I come back at the end of the first growing season, the second growing season, and the fifth growing season, just to see how things are doing. And I do a survival assessment. And if there's problems that pop up, I'll, I'll give the landowner a call and we'll sort out what we can do. Uh, sometimes when, if there's mortality and it's not high, I simply suggest to them that we get an appropriate species. And I've had several landowners willing to go in and spot plant uh, where there's been some losses. And uh, that's a good idea. Uh, I, I do get asked a lot. Um, I, you know, people say, I, I don't want a pure stand of white pine or um, I'd like to have more diversity. And we can do that. Um, it's, it's really cost. The subsidy that Forest Ontario gives me uh, won't cover the cost of hardwoods. So we have to pass on those costs to the landowners. Right now, a white pine tree from the nursery is 80 cents, where a shag bark hickory from the nursery is $1.60. So yeah, so there needs more input from the landowner cost-wise to make that happen right now, based on the subsidy that Forest Ontario is given. Uh, this year, I went out and did my survival assessments. The first year of stuff that we planted uh, last spring uh, is looking good. We're running 90, 95%, and uh, that's, by uh, the rain just came in time. If people remember last year, it was kind of a dry June, July, and then the rain came that saved a lot of trees. Uh, our second year stuffs are running at about 80%. So you're not gonna get them all to live. We, we try the best, but you do lose some just from um, you know, a bit of drought. Uh, you may have some rodent damage and, uh, but overall it's, it's looking really well. Uh, really, we're really pleased. I'm doing 75,000 trees this year. Um, and um, I've got 16 sites uh, uh, in the book and uh, ready to go. And uh, Jim was telling me he's got another 30 or 40 uh, referrals that he'll be sending my way after the planting season starts. The uptake on this is phenomenal right now. Um, 
uh, like I say, I'm looking, I probably have enough uh, to do 2023 as well. Um, that's my final slide there. Um, if you are interested in it, it's a great program um, and uh, I'd highly recommend it. And uh, like I say, we try to tailor the planning to meet your objectives and um, thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Hayes. I'm a board member of the Friends of Salmon River, although I don't actually live in the Salmon River uh, watershed. I live in the Rideau Valley watershed. Um, I have uh, actually, I've, uh, the property on which I live has benefited from the program. We, uh, in 2011, we had some trees planted through the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority. So anyway, um, on behalf of the Friends of Salmon River and all of the uh, members who have joined us for our presentation today, I would like to thank both uh, Jim and Stephen for the, uh, your informative talks. Uh, I'm sure that there are many people who have plenty of questions. So um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Jim and Stephen. And I will turn it over to Susan to uh, moderate the uh, question session. Thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot, Victor. And um, I'm going to hand it to Stephen Moore, who is now going to uh, coordinate all the questions. OK, thank you. And there's nobody on my right for me to hand it to. So I guess <laughs> I'll do the questions. Um, uh, and I will try to direct them to either Steve or um, Jim, but if I direct them in the wrong place, just uh, jump in there. Uh, there were there are lots of, of interest. I mean, people are saying, you know, who's the contact for Central Frontenac or for this area or for that area? Um, Jim, what's the best way for people to get in touch? I know you had a slide that had uh, might have had a website and a uh, phone number on it. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the best way to, to get in touch and start the ball rolling is fill out an application. And, and you're right, Steve, it's uh, Forest Ontario website um, is uh, if you go on that site uh, and then you just uh, click on programs and then the 50 million tree program right away, the, the application pops up. And that's the best way to start. OK. All right. That's excellent. Um, do you have any any stats on whether we've had a net canopy gain since the inception of the program? I I don't have any 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 stats uh, relative to that. I will say that in a in a previous job uh, in the east with South Nation Conservation Authority, they have an active planting program. They plant about a hundred thousand a year, um, and that hundred thousand. Uh, would be a drop in the bucket compared to the forest loss for that area. Ah, right. Do, does everyone plant seedlings? Uh, a question just came up about, uh, is it possible to have success with aerial seed uh, dispersal? Um, we have not gotten involved in aerial seed dispersal, certainly not uh, in, in Southern Ontario. That, that is something that I do, do not believe that would work. Uh, in, in, in the North, the boreal forest, they do do that on, on crown land. And there, there is some success there, but not in the 50 million tree program. Okay. And someone else also want, wondered if fruit trees were eligible. Uh, no, they are not. Okay. No. Okay. Um, and Neither... I'll Go if ahead. I may, uh, if I may add, neither are our trees uh, for Christmas tree production, future Christmas tree production. Ah, uh, right, right, because that turns out to be a commercial endeavor, right? Yes, right. Um, and uh, I'll I'll flip this one over to Steve. Actually, uh, someone asked, uh, can municipalities meet the one hectare uh, minimum by distributing to residents here and there? or does it have to be a one hectare sort of in one block? I've not had any experience with that. Um, so no, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I always thought it was, you know, per property, you know, an agreement was made on a per property basis. So I'm, I, I'm not sure if that would happen. If, if there was a municipality that wanted to distribute trees, 
the over-the-counter program that maybe Jim could speak to might be something that they could tap into. Okay, back to Jim. Yeah, so um, so we do have the, we'll call it the usual 50 million tree program where it goes through myself and then a planting delivery agent works with the private landowner. Um, we do get quite a, a, a lot of requests for areas not only under under one hectare in size, which is 2,000 trees, but definitely under 500 trees. Um, and so the last two years ago, we developed a program called Over the Counter, where the, the landowner picks up the trees for at a discount, 25 cents off a seeding. And you know, in the case of white pine, Steve said it was 80 cents. So you'd, you'd get it at 80 minus 25 cents. And that's for very low orders. And that's called Over the Counter. So we do have a number of conservation authorities, I'm not sure of any municipalities that will order a couple of thousand trees at the reduced price and they use it for a tree giveaway. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there is a question about what is the 15 year commitment? And, uh, is there a, a commitment to be in the program, but uh, what's involved in that commitment? Um, well, I'll start it off. Maybe Steve could add to this. Uh, the 15 year commitment is, is an agreement that identifies the responsibilities of planting delivery agent and the responsibilities of the landowner, uh, which of course is part of that commitment is to uh, undertake sustainable forest management to ensure that the, the program survives, that, or the, pardon me, the plantation survives uh, and the agreement is for 15 years. The agreement also state, it gives us uh, the, uh, the ability to, as Forest Ontario, to evaluate that site, at least in the first five years. Steve, did you want to add to that? Yeah, the other, the other thing that I always mention is uh, your responsibility in the 15 year term is don't cut them uh, uh, again to, to get away from Christmas trees, um, protect them from fire insects, disease and livestock. So if your neighbor's pasturing cattle, make sure the cattle don't get into the trees. Uh, fire is usually not an issue down where we live. Uh, insects and disease, what I tell my uh, clients is, if you see something happening and you're not sure what it is, call me and I'll figure it out for you. Um, usually there's a, a couple things that'll be a, a common uh, pest on trees, for instance, white pine, You'll often see white pine weevil show up and I'll, I'll, I'll give you advice on how to deal with that. The other one on, on white pine might be blister rust might show up uh, at some point. And again, I'll, I'll give you some tips on that. So those are the main ones, fire, insects, disease, livestock, and uh, no cutting. Okay. What is the minimum depth, uh, soil depth for white pines? Uh, there's a question from someone who wants to plant some white pines. Well, with the machine that I use, we need about 14 inches just to get the machine in property. So the deeper, the better. If I was going to be planting trees with the way climate is going these days with droughts, I'd be picking the best land that I have to put them on. Um, and uh, to just to, 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 you know, buffer your, your chances, if you will. But yeah, probably about 14 inches, 16 inches. A lot of that Farmington loam, if you drive north of Newburg, uh, there's a good example of uh, Farmington loam through there. Uh, and if you get over in places like West Plain and north of the Napanee River between Yarker and Camdenese, there's a lot of shallow ground up in there. That's uh, tough stuff to grow on. Yeah, so you're not going to be stuffing them in the cracks and alvars, I guess. Well, no, the, actually, the, the machine will ride on the rock. That's what happens. And then sparks start to fly and the planters get really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Would you recommend anything for a, a sand and gravel pit that's been inoperable since the 60s? Um, yeah, the um, if it's... Yeah, if it's if it's a sandy kind of a situation, red pine. I don't run into a lot of red pine sites where we live because uh, there's not a lot of sand or lighter soil, sandy loam. You do find it along some of the river valleys. I did a nice planting just west of uh, Napanee on Number Two Highway uh, that I'm uh, really proud of because uh, I drive by it a lot and get to see it. But it's a sand and it's doing quite well. I remember one time years ago, we did a restoration. This was through the Ministry of Natural Resources. It was almost pure gravel. I don't know anything that would grow on it. We ended up putting black locust on it. 
uh, and black locusts will just go grow anywhere. And problem is with black locusts is once you plant it, it'll move around on you. So if, if, you, if you have areas that you don't want it to creep into, then, then you'll want to be careful with it. Right. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned, uh, uh, or Jim mentioned part of the uh, commitment was dealing with infestations. Is there a requirement that, that people would use pesticides or um, in terms of this commitment? Well, there's probably products around now that are, uh, you know, m more uh, uh, environment friendly. Uh, you, you know, in the case of gypsy moth, now we have... Uh, was it BT uh, that they use for that, which is fairly fairly safe? Uh, if you run into problems with uh, white pine weevil, you no need for an, an insecticide there. It's just corrective pruning that we use on that. Um, sometimes you maybe run into some sawflies, which is a larva that eats needles. And I, I've had people, uh, you know, if it's just a small infestation, just get a can of Raid, which is fairly safe to use, but. Uh, yeah, I've I've never uh, run into anything where we have to use some really high high strength or, or more lethal type of insecticide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another site specific question: Someone has thirty six acres, which is mostly marsh in North Frontenac, and it's designated wetland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bless you. Uh, and that. Um, you know, I know you don't plant shrubs or anything like that, but is there anything that you would recommend for that land? Uh, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a wetland, I might let, let it just leave it as a wetland uh, and let nature take its course. Occasionally, if you run into a real wet site, uh, tamarack will grow on a real wet site. I don't do a lot of tamarack because wet sites are really wet when we're planting in early spring and we can't get near them with a tractor uh but if that that might be something but it, it would really you'd real i'd really want to take a look at it before i recommended anything because it may be taking care of itself on its own uh yeah, yeah absolutely and, and maybe to protect the wetland because i know wetlands sequester more carbon per acre than uh forests do so maybe mm -hmm. the idea is to protect that wetland um, do, do you, if you're going to plant close to a property line, do you require a survey? Um, because you don't do the surveys. I mean, uh, no, most of what I, most of what I run into, it's, it's, everything's well fenced. Um, and, um, never, never had an issue that way. No. Okay. No. Now, do you have any projects on Wolf Island? No, Rick Napton looks after all of that. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, and Rick does have projects on on Wolf yeah. Island. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jim, jump in here anytime. Just uh, yep. it's just yep, to be a for sure. Yeah. In between. <laughs> yeah, that's the that area is part of the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority, and that as as Steve said, that's uh, Rick is the contact, and uh, he has uh, quite a few projects on Wolf Island. Okay. Are and I'll stay with you, Jim. Someone asks, are white pine uh, notorious for being susceptible to ice damage and if there's land that has a lot of fog and ice build up does that require a specific kind of tree well i would say that that uh, a lot of trees are susceptible to ice damage that's the first comment the second comment which is probably more important is uh, what steve and all the other planting delivery agents do is they plant uh, they identify the best tree for that site and what has the greatest chance of survival. And they'll take into consideration, as we heard, uh, the soil texture, the soil depth, um, maybe even prevailing winds and, and adjacent forests. So it's really all about matching the species to, to the site uh, whether the, and, and the conditions, whether that's uh, you know, heavy fog or, 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 or ice from time to time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of interest in soil maps. Once uh, Steve showed his, everybody wants one. And I know in the chat, Eric Boyson has said to use the Agricultural Information Atlas from OMAFRA, and he provides a link, which I would direct people to. Uh, any other suggestions, Jim, or is that really the best place to go? Oh, I think, I think that's, that's an excellent place to go. Um, guys like Steve and I, we, we have the, the hard copies, I would assume. Steve has those. 
um, but um, they're all up to date on, on online um, and they're no different than the, than the hard copy. So I wouldn't say there's any other place. Great. So uh, I'll, direct, I'll direct people to the chat. Steve? Yeah, all those, most of those soil maps are available online right now. So you can zero in on them and, and find them. Yeah. All right. Thanks to Eric for uh, posting that uh, link for us. Um, and, oh, uh, someone just wants to know, do you look after Shannonville, Melrose, north of the 401? Yes. Okay. Yep. Got right. a few plantings up in there. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, I want to say thank you very much for uh, answering all these questions and uh, all the information you gave. And this certainly is a worthwhile program. And it's, uh, I'm also glad uh, we had over 100 participants uh, listening. So, uh, so it was excellent. Uh, thanks for your time and expertise. I had my slides back. Ooh, <laughs> so this has been yeah I, I echo that idea it's been uh it's been just great last two slides it's been just great having uh this wealth of information for everybody so that <laughs> find out everything just by looking at our websites um and it's been uh, particularly enjoyable to have both jim and steve available for um for there we go available for all this information. I'm just going to show you oops, our last two slides, uh, because some of you will probably be members already. Um, the Ontario Woodlot Association is also very much involved, of course, in um, similar uh, programs, and they are a nonprofit that looks after, uh, that promotes sustainable forestry, um, and that people can join. And I just have uh, noted here the limestone chapter, which is Kingston Frontenac, um, LNA area, and the Quinty chapter in Hastings, uh, so that if anybody is interested, they can um, always get in touch with them or look up their website to just find out a little more about them. And last, oh, and actually, before I change, the other thing I would like to note too is if anybody um, is interested in a um, related tree program, um, you might remember last year we actually had a whole presentation on the shoreline restoration program, which is done through Watersheds Canada and also Cooney Conservation. So if you want planting, definitely smaller scale than 50 million, um, if anybody is looking to have plantings done on a shoreline, um, those are the two organizations to contact, or you can actually look in our last year's um, uh, list of presentations in our winter speaker series. And there is one there, you can look on our websites, uh, Friends of Napanee or Friends of Salmon websites. And there's one there called Watersheds 101 and Shoreline Restoration. Ask Lawrence to come back in where this recording will be available. This recording? Yes. Yeah, let me finish up. So our um, next presentation will be Tuesday, February 8th. And at this one, Friends of the Napanee River will actually host Betty Plews from Climate Legacy. And she's going to address how seniors can use their voice to influence the climate agenda across many different levels. So stay tuned because we will be giving you more information about all of that. Uh, for next time. Uh, Lawrence, are you still there? I'm here. Good. <laughs> Do you just want to address where the um, the uh, recording is going to be? Yeah, so uh, what, once we get the recording, we will, um, we have to do a little bit of work on it, you know, compile it and all that good stuff. But basically, it will be posted to a YouTube channel. And our channel is Friends of the Napanee River. What we'll do is we'll send out the link to the YouTube channel and uh, in this presentation uh, by email. And if others want to get it that you know don't get the email, then they can go to either of the uh, Friends of the Salmon River or Friends of the Napanee River websites, and we'll have it uh, put there as well. Oh, very good. Will you also post the chat because I found there's was lots of good information this time in the chat from various people. Yeah, the, ch the chat is a little more difficult with YouTube because they don't allow attachments. So what I would have to do is uh, we could we could post, I gotta think about this, we would post the chat text document, if you would, 
well, uh, on each of our websites and that, that'll help folks out a lot. Okay. Great, okay. Um, I think I will also send out, uh, uh, just in, to help people out, um, I will also send out the email addresses in the, in the Forest Ontario website, just to make sure people have that when we are sending out the link. So folks, that wraps it all up for tonight. Thanks so much. Uh, this has been a, a, a great session. We had it at our peak, we had 115 people joining. So I'm so glad that everybody's um, had a chance, had, has a chance to get all this great information. Thanks so much again to Jim and Steve, and we shall hopefully see you again on February 8th. Good night. Thanks a lot. Night. See you, Jim. Bye now. Thank you. You too. So I guess we can.